Hey, welcome to my channel. In this tutorial, we are going to make a deep dive into Cloud Firestore security rules. Rules are the most important part of the security of a database in Firebase. Essentially, rules dictate who and when has access to the data. And what I mean here by access is whether to read or write data in the database. In addition to that, Rules can be used to validate which type or format data should be in before storing it in the database. Security rules in Cloud Firestore should be written following this syntax. The rules version were introduced to the rules not so long ago. It doesn't affect how rules work only in a certain case which is when we use the recursive wildcards. I'll keep that for later. The service cloud.firestore declaration scopes the rules to Cloud Firestore preventing conflicts between Cloud Firestore security rules and rules for other products such as Cloud Storage. The first match statement specifies that rules should match any Cloud Firestore database in the project. The second in pretty much every match statement within the first match block refers to the location of a certain part of the database. Keep in mind that match statements must point to documents only, not collections. Now, within a match block, we should set the allow keyword followed by the privilege and a condition. So, if the condition returns true, the access is allowed. On the other hand, if false, the access is denied. In general, a privilege is a read or write access. That said, both of these privileges can be divided into smaller sub-privileges. More on that later on. Let's get started with a very basic read and write access rules to the user1 document. In this example, I'm not able to write or read data from any document except the user1 document because by default, the access is denied for any document that doesn't have its role set. Therefore, let's say we want anyone to read and write data in all of the documents within the user's collection. To do that, we need to set the privileges for each document to true, which could be an endless and exhausting job if we try to write these rules for each single document on its own. Thus comes the utility of the wildcard syntax. A wildcard works pretty similar to the iterator in the for each loop. In this case, the user variable will contain each document at a time, set its rules, and then do the same with the next document. The read operation is in fact composed of two sub-operations which are get and list. Get is when a user wants to read data from a single document. In other words, it's when we use the doc method and we pass a certain document's name as parameter to get this specific document's data.
List, on the other hand, is used when a user wants to get data from an entire collection calling the get method, or when we query the database through the where method so that we get multiple documents responding to that query as a result. Keep in mind that we still can get data from a document through the list privilege if it's set to true, even if the get privilege is set to false. The write operation in its turn is composed of three sub-operations which are update, delete and create. Without any further explanation, each of these operations name explain exactly what each of them refers to. If we have subcollections, their rules must be set explicitly because they don't follow the same rules as their parent collections. Let's set the read operation to false as a rule for every document in the city's collection. That done, reading from these documents should be denied. Yet, if we want the documents within the landmark subcollection to be accessible, we need to create a nested match block and set its documents read operation to true. We can do the same without nesting the match block of the subcollection. We just need to specify its full path at the match declaration.
The option of defining a rule for documents within a collection in every subcollection is still viable through what is called a recursive wildcard. Using this syntax in this example means that every document in the city's collection is readable as well as any document in a subcollection. Here's where you notice the difference between the two versions, since in this example, in version 1, the path matches every document in the subcollection, but not the documents within the collection. On the other hand, the same path matches every document within the parent collection in its subcollections in version 2. Another difference is that in version 2, we can put the recursive wildcard wherever we want in the match statement. Therefore, in this example, we can set the rule for every document within a collection or a subcollection, aka collection group. Sometimes we could stumble upon a case where we set the role of a certain document in two or more different places. In this situation, if an operation is permitted in only one of the roles, it's the same as setting it to true in the rest of the other ones, even if we literally set that operation to false in the rest of the roles. Time to talk about conditions. One of the most classics is the authenticated to have access permission, which means that the user has to be authenticated to read or write data. To check whether a user is authenticated or not, we have to make use of the request.auth variable, which contains the UID of the client requesting data. As you might know, whenever a user signs up to your app through the Firebase Authentication Library, a unique ID is created for that user. So, in this condition, if the auth variable is not null, that essentially means the user requesting the data is actually authenticated, Thus, the condition returns true, and therefore the read access is permitted. We can also create conditions around an exact user with a certain UID, not only someone who is authenticated to grant access to. Furthermore, we can make a user check only their own data by comparing the request.uid with the key of the document. The user variable in the condition refers to the wildcard. We can also use requested data as part of the permissions conditions through the resource variable, which refers to the requested document. In this example, the read privilege is granted only to documents that have allow read field, and that must be set to true. If not, any read request will be denied.
We can also base conditions around the data sent by the user. In this example, the update operation won't be allowed unless the data coming from the request has an age field that must be a number and has a value greater than 30. Data within another collection can be used in conditions, like in this example, the read access is granted to the documents in the city's collection only if the user1 document exists in the user's collection. Keep in mind that we need to escape variables in the paths just like in ESX syntax. Here, the user is granted the read access to the city's collections documents only if they are authenticated and have a document in the user's collection with their UID as key. Custom functions can be helpful to organize the code and make it easier to read. It's almost the same as usual JavaScript function declaration, yet you need to keep in mind that functions can contain only a single return statement. They can automatically access functions and variables from the scope in which they are defined. They may call other functions but may not recurse. The total call stack depth is limited to 10. A very important thing to consider is that rules are not filters, which means that we cannot write a query for all documents in a collection, 
and expect Cloud Firestore to return only the documents that the current client has permission to access. So, in this example, even if I have two documents that have the allow read field set to true, the get request won't be able to return any data because of the existence of documents where the same field is set to false, which goes against what we set in the rule. In other words, the get method would be able to return data only if all the documents respond to the condition in the rule with true, which means the request whether return all the data or nothing at all. Thus, in case you want only the part that respond to the condition with true, you have to query the database using the where method and use the field as a querying field. This should be enough for this tutorial. Make sure to subscribe and see you in the next one.